our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, hello again. Good to be with you. Um, Man, so excited to get to preach God's word. But before we get into that, uh, believe it or not, uh, Easter is three weeks away. All right, we're, are we at church or not? Easter is three weeks away, right? I don't know if you know this or not, uh, but it's kind of a big deal. And it's not a big deal because we're not like Easter's our Super Bowl as a church and let's rally the troops. Like, we don't care. That's dumb. Whatever. What we do care about is the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Our entire faith is built on that reality that Jesus got up from the grave promising that all who trust in him will too one day rise to be with him forever. And so we make a big deal out of Easter because it's the centrality of our faith. And so we're going to celebrate in two specific ways. The first is on Good Friday, we're going to do uh, this uh, new thing for a lot of us called a Stations of the Cross display. Now, depending on your kind of background uh, in church history, that might bring up some different responses or different reactions. But here's kind of what I, I want to kind of narrate it, is that essentially think of it like a uh, contemplative prayer room. It's a chance for us to mark throughout the day whenever you're able to come for just a few minutes right downstairs in the Calhoun room to pray and to reflect on the crucifixion of our Savior. We've got some beautiful graphic art that we're going to be displaying, guiding us through the Passion Week, ending with the death of Christ, getting us ready to celebrate uh, bodily and excitedly on Sunday uh, the good news of the resurrection. And then on Sunday, we're going to gather for one big resurrection party. So we're going to be here at 9 a.m. We've got free lattes and free donuts at 930. We've got for the kids, an Easter egg hunt for the kids. So we're going to be doing that. That's going to be a ton of fun. And then Lord willing and weather permitting, we're going to be worshiping together on the roof up on the fifth floor, overlooking our beautiful city of Charlotte together, getting to celebrate Jesus. It's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, Jackson and I were up there kind of mapping it out today and just being up there this morning was like, this is going to be such a gift. What a beautiful opportunity we have. And so really excited. Hope you've made plans to join us. Um, Also, we have invite cards, little business size invite cards that we would love to get in your hands to get in somebody else's hands. And so your neighbor, your coworker, your friend, your family member that you want to invite, you can pick those up. They're going to be on a table right outside the doors on your way out. We'd love for you to grab a stack of those, take them to hand them out um, in the different relationships that you live in. All right, let's dive into God's word. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to get into it together. Lord, thank you so much for today. Lord, thank you for this Lord's prayer that we get to think about and reflect on and contemplate together once again this morning. Lord, we're grateful for a chance to think once again about what you are inviting us into in prayer. So Lord, would you be with us, be present to us, Open our hearts, lower our defenses. Lord, help us to be present to you, present to one another, present even to our own bodies. We need you. We love you. Pray all these things in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, during my time in seminary, I was assigned to read the biography of a man named George Mueller. Now, if you're not familiar, George Mueller was a 19th century minister whose calling on his life was to care for vulnerable children across England. He also looks a little bit like Abraham Lincoln. And over the course of Mueller's 93 years of life, he had the privilege of starting 117 schools, which cared for over 10,000 orphans and educated over 120,000 children. But believe it or not, that's not actually what Mueller is most known for in Christian circles today. Mueller is most famous because of his fundraising strategy, or rather lack thereof. You see, Mueller felt called by God to never ask or write a single letter asking for donations from those outside his ministry, but rather he felt like God called him to, quote, pray in the donations. And over the course of his ministry, Mueller raised what today would be the equivalent of $97 million, having never asked for a single dime. 
If you read the biography, you would read one story in particular about a certain morning early on in his ministry where Mueller stands up in front of 300 orphan children, knowing that there's nothing in the cupboard to feed them that morning for breakfast. And as the story goes, Mueller prayed, quote, Lord, thank you for providing our daily bread. And as soon as Mueller said, amen, there was a knock on the door. And a baker shows up carrying three fresh baked loaves, trays of loaves of bread saying, hey, I just felt led this morning to get up early and make these for you. Just a few minutes later, there's another knock on the door. And it's a milkman whose cart had broken down right outside of the orphanage. And he said, hey, all this milk's going to spoil. So can you use all of these cartons of fresh made milk? We are continuing this morning through our journey line by line in the Lord's Prayer. We're looking this morning at verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. A prayer that for George Mueller some 200 years ago had been answered in the most immediate, tangible, and specific way. Now, to be honest, I'm very tempted this morning to preach a very simple sermon to tell you this incredible story of George Mueller, to tell you that this line invites us to bring our requests to God, to stir up our emotions with stories of God's provision now and in history, and then to send you praying. And that wouldn't be wrong. That'd be faithful to the text, and that would be a good thing to do as a pastor. But to be honest with you, when I read that story almost a decade ago, and even now when I tell it, there's actually all sorts of these mixed emotions that rise up in my soul. And I wonder if the same is true for you. So on the one hand, I'm definitely stirred to greater faith, right? I read about Mueller, I read about the milkman and the baker, and I want to go out and pray bold prayers that Jesus might answer immediately and suddenly in my midst. But there's also equally within me these feelings of shame and sadness and even insecurity that sit on my heart. There's a part of me that hears that story and, to be honest, doesn't want to run to prayer, but rather wants to run from prayer prayer. First, because I immediately think about all of my prayers for quote-unquote daily bread that I believe have been left unanswered. Good requests. Lord, would you provide this? Would you step in here? Would you take care of my need? Good, what seemed like God-glorifying requests that for another reason or another have not been resolved how I wanted. But it also makes me want to run from prayer because I, to be honest, don't really know what to do with my desires as a follower of Jesus. Like I know what to do with my big kingdom desires, right? Like I know what to do with the desires for my neighbor to get saved or for God to take care of the suffering in the world. I know what to do with those. I pray them boldly and passionately. And I even know what to do with my evil desires, right? The ones contrary to the kingdom of God. I repent and I confess and I turn those over to the Lord. But, but what do I do with the desires in the middle, You ever ask yourself that question, right? Those desires that aren't world changing or wicked, they're just sort of there. It's the great parking spot conundrum. Have you ever thought about that in prayer? Dan, our director of Groups and Connect, he says that his grandmother has this prayer where every time she's parking, she would say, Father God, full of grace, help me find a parking space. Is that okay? Genuinely, like, does God care about that? What happens if there's one parking space left and I'm praying for it and so is somebody else? Am I even allowed? Does God care about me finding a parking spot? Do you ever wrestle with those questions? Like, am I supposed to or even allowed to pray about this lingering cough that won't go away after being sick two weeks ago? Am I supposed to or even allowed to ask God for a promotion at work or to get more recognition from my boss? Am I supposed to or even allowed to ask God to help my child sleep so I don't have to be up at 2 a.m. for the fifth night in a row? Am I supposed to or even allowed to ask God for a husband or a wife or for more friends or for a friend? Do you resonate with those questions at all? I would guess that you do because over the past few weeks as I've been thinking about and researching and studying and praying about this sermon time and time again, I'll ask folks, what does it look like for you to ask God for what you need? And predominantly most people say, I don't. I have good intentions too. I have good uh, desires to, but when it comes to me actually sitting before the Lord and giving him my request, most of the time I don't know if my requests are worthwhile to give. I don't know what to do with my desires. Because to be honest with you, this line in the Lord's Prayer feels a little bit out of place, does it not? We just got done praying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. And right after this, we're going to pray, forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation. Like, I'm good with those. But give us this day our daily bread? How common, how ordinary 
how normal. And yet, I think if we have eyes to see it, how beautiful and necessary. But in order to see that, we have to be willing to venture a little bit deeper than just what's on the surface of this line, because this is a specific word choice from Jesus, right? Jesus doesn't say, pray like this, give us this day our daily needs. He doesn't say, give us this day our daily wants. He doesn't say, give us this day our daily requests. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And it would have been impossible for his audience of Jewish disciples that he's speaking to in the Sermon on the Mount to hear that phrase daily bread and not have in the back of their minds Exodus chapter 16, the most famous of daily bread stories in the Old Testament, the story of manna in the wilderness. And so if you've got a Bible or your phone, go ahead and get there with me. It won't be on the screens. Just fair warning. If you need a Bible, there should be some in the backs of the seats. If you don't own a Bible, please take that home. That's our gift to you. Read it. Start in the book of Matthew right in the middle. We'll think you'll encounter Jesus and become a Christian. So take that home, read it. But we'll be in Exodus chapter 16. It's near the front. I just want to look at this story together and consider the implications for what it means for this line of the prayer. Exodus chapter 16, we're just going to start in verse 1 and work our way through it together. To give you the context, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. God had raised up Moses and Aaron, led them out of slavery, the ten plagues, you know, that whole thing, you've seen the movie, leads them across the Red Sea on dry land, right? They come to the other side of the sea, Moses has this beautiful song of worship, and then this is where we're at, right on the other side of the sea, in the wilderness. Chapter 16 of Exodus, verse 1. You there? Good? All right. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people, which just so in case you're not familiar, 600,000 of them, 600,000 people came to the wilderness of Sin. What a place. Which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. I get upset if one person's grumbling. Can you imagine 600,000? And the whole congregation grumbled. And the people, verse 3, of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So, a.k.a., hey, you should have left us as slaves, because at least we were fed slaves. Verse 4, the Lord hears this, and he says to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. The people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So God says, every day I'm going to rain bread from heaven. And every day for six, for five days, they're to gather what they need that day. But on the sixth day, they're to gather for two days, setting aside the Sabbath, part of God's design, one day of rest. Verse 6, so Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling. If you like to write in your Bibles, if you have one of ours, feel free to, just to underline it. It's a really key phrase, he has heard your grumbling. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. So he repeats it again. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Verse nine, then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. There it is a third time. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, again, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. If you continue through 13 through 21, bread's going to rain down, and some people aren't going to listen to the first command. They're going to try to gather on days one through five for multiple days, and they're going to wake up the next morning and realize that bread they tried to save is rotted. And God's like, I told you, each day, get what you need for each day. And then if you keep going 22 through 30, they're going to break the next part of the command. On the sixth day, some of them aren't going to save aside, set some aside for two days. And God again is going to say, will you trust me? Will you follow my design? Five days you get for one day, six days you get for two days. They break this. They need to learn to trust him. That's what happens there. Skip down to verse 31. 
Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. This little piece of manna they set aside is eventually going to make its way into the Ark of the Covenant, the place in the temple where they believed God's spirit lived among the Israelites. That's how important this little piece of bread, a marker of God's faithfulness to his people is going to be for them. Verse 34, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people of Israel ate the manna for how long? 40 years. Okay, what? (laughs) We read the book of Exodus and we think it flies, right? We're like, boom, boom, boom. Cool story, cool story. Parting Red Sea, manna. 40 years they are going to wake up every day needing God to rain bread from heaven. 40 years. We're a relatively young church. That is longer than most of us in the room have been alive. 40 years. Four decades, right? 1993 to now. 40 years. 1983 to now. Yep, that's why I'm a pastor. Thank you, Canon. That was going to be a good point until that happened. Verse 35, the people of Israel ate the manna, for, I do not oversee our budget, ate the manna 40 <laughs> years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is the 10th part of an ephah. All right, that's, that's the story, right? That's what's almost certainly ruminating in the back of the disciples' minds as they hear this line from Jesus. Pray then like this, give us this day our daily bread. And so let me try to apply this into our lives based on Exodus 16, based on this line. What does it mean? What does it mean for us here and now to pray, give us this day, Lord, our daily bread? I think it means three things. Here's number one. Praying this prayer means we can and should and must bring all of our requests to God. Praying, give us this day our daily bread means we can and should and must bring all of our requests to God. Notice the trajectory of the passage, right? Verses two and three, they're hungry and they start grumbling to Moses and Aaron. You let us out here to kill us with hunger. And verses six through eight, Moses and Aaron are like, who are we? You're grumbling against us? The Lord led you out of slavery. And then look at verse nine. So come near before the Lord for that phrase that we saw repeated over and over again. He has heard your grumbling. Do you hear the invitation from the Lord through Moses to the people of God? Do any of you lack bread? Do any of you hunger? Are any of you in the wilderness with needs left unsatisfied? Bring your grumbling to God. Even think about the simplicity of the line, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Who needs to eat bread? Mostly all of us, right? For you that are gluten-free in the room, give us to stay our daily kale salad, all right? That's the best example I got. Everyone needs to eat bread. That's what's so shocking about this invitation. Everyone needs to eat bread. So this prayer is an invitation for everyone to pray about everything at all times to God. What do we do with our needs? What do we do with our wants? What do we do with our desires? We bring them before the Heavenly Father and we ask Him. No request is too small or mundane for us to bring to our Heavenly Father because it is a good thing for the people of God to have bread. If you were to track the narrative of the Old Testament, one of the constant themes you'll see is that a lack of bread, famine is bad for the people of God, and abundance of bread, provision of bread is a good gift from the Lord. This land of Canaan that talks about the end of Exodus 16 that they're headed to, that they'll get to in 40 years, and then they'll spend some time before they actually get in. That land is described twice in scripture as a place of abundant bread. Not having bread as the people of God is never the goal. And I love what God does here because he doesn't chastise the Israelites in Exodus 16, right? They show up and they're grumbling before him. And it doesn't say that he responds like, get over it. You have me. You don't need bread. I know you're in the wilderness. I know you're hungry. I know you're not satisfied, but you've got me. Get over it. It's not what he says. He says, hey, Moses and Aaron, tell them to stop grumbling to you. Tell them to grumble to me because I hear it and I'm going to give them bread. Know what he says in verse 12? 
I've heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. So say to them, at twilight you're going to have meat, and in the morning you're going to have bread. I've heard your grumbling. I've heard your need. I've heard your desire. Here's some bread. That's the invitation of this prayer. We bring our desires for bread to God, no matter how ordinary or boring or normal they are. We voice our needs to God. But this is hard for us, right? Let's just be honest. It's hard to ask God for daily bread. And I think that's for a few reasons. I think for some of us, it's hard to ask God for daily bread because we're afraid, validly so, of turning God into a cosmic genie. Right? We don't want to have this relationship with God where we think he exists just to satisfy my needs and take care of me and answer my requests. And listen, that is a good fear to have. All right, God is not your personal butler. He does not float around heaven waiting. Oh, great, you asked me for something? Good, I have something to do now, right? Like, that's not what God exists for. He does not exist to be ordered around by us as humans. But here's what I've been learning more and more as a pastor. And if you've taught me over the past few months, I've given you this analogy. Most of the Christian life is lived between two ledges, right? It's lived between two ledges. And most of the time in my pastoral experience, we're very afraid of the ledge we're not actually closest to. So what happens is somebody will talk to somebody, or I will, I'll just use me, I'll talk to somebody and they'll be like, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm really afraid of being a legalist. Like, I don't want to work my way to God. I just want to be, you know, accepting of his grace. And it's like, bro, you've never chosen holiness once in your life. <laughs> like, you're not even close. Like, what are you talking to? You're afraid of legalism? Or you'll talk to the other side. They'll be like, I just don't want to be an antinomian. Like, I don't want to just run around and do whatever. I want to like really obey God. And it's like, yeah, but you've never laughed. Like, you've never enjoyed your life once because you're so afraid of God. Right? Life is lived between two ledges, and in my experience, we're usually afraid of the ledge we're not actually closest to. And so is there a real danger in treating God like a cosmic genie? Yes and amen, absolutely. I just don't think that's the ledge most of us in the room and in our church are actually in danger of falling off of. In my experience, most of us are more afraid to ask God for anything, to ever come to him with our need, to ever come to him with what we desire or long for or want. I think for others of us, we don't ask God for our daily bread because somewhere along the way, we got it into our minds that contentment means doing away with desire. We've come to believe that if I'm to be content with what I have, that means I have to stop desiring what I don't have. And so you'll hear it with stuff like, well, if I'm not, I'm not truly content in my singleness until I stop desiring a spouse. Or I'm not truly content with my job until I stop desiring a better one. If I can just free you up here, that's not the Bible. That's not the scriptures. According to the scriptures, contentment is not a doing away of the desire, but a trusting of God in the midst of the desire such that we are actually willing to ask him for it. And yet still for others, we struggle to ask God for daily bread because we don't want to be disappointed. And so unfortunately, we've convinced ourselves or others we're content when really we're just afraid to be let down. And what looks like contentment is actually disguised cynicism and self-protection. And we call it contentment, right, because it seems holier to say we're content when really we're just afraid to ask God for something and for him to say no. We're afraid to keep asking God for something, for him to keep saying no. But let me suggest to you that we typically are much more shy, reserved, and afraid to ask God for our daily bread than he tells us to be in the scriptures. I'll just give you a small handful of these. There's so many verses we could go to. James 4, 2. James, the brother of Jesus, picking up on the teachings of Jesus, says you do not have because you do not ask. Matthew 6, right before the Lord's Prayer, verse 7, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. Or right after the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Or consider Paul in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So the invitation to pray, give us this day our daily bread, is an invitation to go to our Father who delights to give good things and ask him for our needs and our desires and our wants. And I'm learning this firsthand right now. So for me, right now, praying for daily bread in my house looks like, Lord, I need you to help find my kids' shoes so we can leave on time. Lord, I need you to help me get this really difficult left turn out of my neighborhood so I won't be late to my meeting. Lord, I need you to have, help me have words for this hard conversation le later. Lord, I need you to help this caffeine kick in because I'm struggling to stay awake to work on this project. Now, I'll be honest, should I be asking for those things? I don't know. <laughs> 
Can I be that honest? I know it's church. I know I'm one of the pastors, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I should bring my, trying to find my kids' shoes to the Lord, but here's what I do know. In bringing a simple request as that to the Lord, I do know my faith has grown. I do know my, my trust has grown. Because, and that leads to point two, asking for daily bread is an act of faith. Asking for daily bread is an act of faith. Look back with me at Exodus 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. That phrase, whether they will walk in my law or not, that's Old Testament phrasing for whether or not they will trust me and follow what I say. If I give them bread, but I make them go back day by day and on the sixth day for two days so they can keep the Sabbath, will they trust me? Will they trust that I'll provide it again tomorrow? Will they trust that I know what they need? Will they trust my ways and my hand of provision in their lives? And as we see in the story, some of them don't, right? They try to gather for multiple days. They go back on the sixth day and they don't gather for the seventh. They have to learn over the course of these 40 years to trust, to pray, give us this day our daily bread, and then trust that God will answer exactly what that daily bread needs to be. Asking for daily bread is an act of faith. Lord, I'm asking for what I need today, and I trust in faith that you're good, and I trust in faith that you know what I need. And Matthew 6 says, if I seek first your kingdom, you will take care of exactly what I need. And so when we ask for daily bread, it means I'm trusting that what God gives me is exactly what I need. I'm trusting that he will answer according to his good purposes. And this requires faith, because sometimes that answer is yes. (laughs) Sometimes we say, God, this is what I need, and he says, yep, here you go which is sometimes terrifying, (laughs) but it's an invitation to respond with joy. But it also requires faith because sometimes that answer is no. Lord, give me this day my daily bread. No, that's not actually your daily bread today. We have to learn to say with the psalmist in Psalm 3410, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. That is a prayer of faith. God, I'm trusting that you, because you said no, that's not what you had for me. And I'm trusting that you know best. Lord, I would have given myself that promotion if I were you, but I'm trusting that I lack no good thing. Lord, I would have had us get the house we put the offer on, but I'm trusting that I lack no good thing. I'm trusting you to take care of what I need. And then we can even go back to last week's prayer, right? When the answer is no, we say, Lord, I'm going to lament this because I wanted it to be yes. And now I'm grieving and now I need to lament as an act of good trust in your faithfulness. I love J.I. Packer for this. He says, now comes the real test of faith. You, the Christian, have prayed for today's bread. Will you now believe that what comes to you, much or little, is God's answer? And will you, on that basis, be content with it and grateful for it? Sometimes that answer is no. Sometimes that answer is keep asking. God loves to hear his children ask. Sometimes he intends to say yes, but desires to grow our faith through making us ask more and for longer durations than we're often wanting to or ready to. And sometimes that answer is to change our desire, right? Don't don't worry about sorting out the desire. Am I allowed to bring this to him? Am I not? Just bring it. And sometimes that answer is, hey, I'm actually going to reshape your desire to show you instead what you should be asking for. I got a picture of this a few weeks ago. Uh, Harper woke up the day after her birthday party, and for breakfast, she said, Dad, can I have cake? That's a stupid request, <laughs> right? Like, I love my kid, right? No, cake for, okay, cake for breakfast is sometimes a good thing. But for her, it's a bad thing, right? That's going to hurt your stomach. It's going to give you way more sugar than you need to head into the day. Like, this is not good for you. But I love that she asked because her bringing that desire to me means that I can respond and reshape her desire and show her what she should want instead. And that's the invitation. I don't know if I should bring this desire to you, Lord, but I'm just going to bring it and I'm going to trust and sit and listen to you and let you reshape the desire if you think daily bread is actually something else for me. I love N.T. Wright for this. He says, our natural longings for bread and all that it symbolizes are not to be shunned as though they are of themselves evil. God knows our desires in order that we may turn them into prayer, in order that they may be sorted out, straightened out, untangled, and reaffirmed. I love that. We bring our desires to God in prayer that he might sort them out, straighten them out, untangle them, and reaffirm what they should be. All right, so that's the first two. We can and should and must bring all of our requests to God. Asking for daily bread is an act of faith, but there's one more thing, even under the surface of Exodus 16. And to see that, we've got to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, just a few 
books over. This is Moses re-summarizing and narrating kind of all of the Exodus story, with more detail and more application. Deuteronomy chapter 8, he's going to tell what happens, and this is what he says. He says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And this is the key, verse 3. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna. Notice that. He humbled you, he let you hunger, and then he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Here's why. That he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. That sounds familiar to you. That's exactly what Jesus will quote in his temptation in the wilderness. When Satan comes up and says, turn these stones into bread, he quotes Deuteronomy 8. Man shall not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Point number three, asking for daily bread leads us to God. Asking for daily bread leads us to God. I love Deuteronomy 8. He says, God lets you hunger. He lets you go without. And then he fed you so that you would understand that you will not live by bread alone. Because underneath our desire for bread is always a deeper desire, a deeper hunger. And so God says, I'd let you feel that hunger, and then I fed you so that you would understand life does not come from bread, but come from me. Because go back to this, right? What is the point of prayer? What is the underlying goal of prayer? Somebody. Communion with God, right? Four weeks ago, that was a great sermon. Communion with God, right? The underlying goal of prayer is communion with God. And so get this, Deuteronomy 8 shows us that when we move to bringing him our requests, we're not moving away from communion, we're moving deeper into communion. Do you see that? So we're not saying, all right, we commune with God, we celebrate him, now we're on this request piece. No, requests are a part of how we move deeper into the communion. And so in telling us and inviting us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, Jesus is taking us deeper into our relationship with him to show us, even if you get the bread, on the other side of the bread is me. It's God. I'd let them hunger, and then guess what? I didn't leave them in their hunger, I gave them bread. Why? So they would know bread's never enough. It's never enough. On the other side of bread is God. I read a story a few months ago that I think illustrates this so much. It's by a guy named Pete Greig. He wrote a book called How to Pray. It's one of my favorite books on prayer. He's the uh, international director for 24-7 Prayer, which is this great organization uh, setting up prayer rooms across the world. He wrote two really good books, How to Pray and then How to Hear God. That one's fine, but How to Pray is really good. And he tells this story in his chapter on bringing requests to God, where he talks about this vacation that his family went on with another family, where they were going to sail for a week in the Adriatic Sea off the coast of Croatia, which is like goals. I don't know what that even means, but that sounds awesome. So here they are on a catamaran for a week in the Adriatic Sea. And he says, this is one of these days is just perfect. They're, they're kind of anchored in this little harbor, and they're swimming, and the sun's out, and it's just perfect weather. Temperature is awesome. The water temperature is perfect. And they're just having a blast. And the day kind of wraps up and the sun is setting and they're laying out this beautiful dinner and the weather's perfect and they're all smiling. And next thing they know as they sit down to eat dinner, this swarm of mosquitoes just like descend on the boat. And he says, all right, at this point, you're probably not feeling sorry for me because I am in the Adriatic Sea sailing, right? But he says, here's what happens. The swarm of mosquitoes descend on the boat and his friend immediately is like, hey, we should pray. And he's like, are you, what are, you, are you kidding me? Like, God doesn't care about this. Like, we're in the Adriatic Sea on a sailboat off the coast of Croatia. God has bigger things on his plate than taking care of our little mosquito problem. This is not daily bread. This is mosquitoes. We're fine. But everybody else on the boat's like, yeah, let's pray. And so he's like, well, I'm the international director of 24-7 prayer. I can't not pray. And so <laughs> they start praying, and they start, you know, asking the Lord, Lord, would you remove these mosquitoes? Would you take care of this? We want to enjoy this time together. And he says, I kid you not, as soon as they said amen, this giant uh, wind sweeps out and pushes the mosquitoes away to never return. He's writing about this. And he says, this is his response. And I, I love this. I mean, it, it's so what I feel in my soul. It says, to this day, I don't know whether that was an actual proper answer to prayer or just a well-timed meteorological fluke masquerading as one. But this I do know. And I know it for us. When you pray about the small things in life, you get to live with greater gratitude. And I would add one small line to that. I would say you also get to live with greater communion. So can I bring this request to God? I don't know. 
But what I do know is when I learn to bring everything to him, that I get to deepen my communion with him. Because sometimes he's going to say yes, and it would have been yes either way. Maybe even if I hadn't have prayed, the Lord would have done that anyway. But I know what I do know, I now get to celebrate the fact that he answered prayer. And when he says no, maybe it would have been a no anyway, even if I didn't pray. But here's what I do know. Now I get to lament and be sorrowful deeper in communion with him in prayer. Because if you never learn to bring your desires to God, you will never find communion with him on the other side of them. And so that's the invitation. We pray, give us this day our daily bread for all things at all times, because in so doing, we get more of God. And that's the goal of prayer. That's the underlying thing in this entire series that I hope you hear is underlying all of this. this, Jesus wants us to know the Father, even in our requests. And so here's what we're going to do, as we've been doing all series long, is we're going to give us some space to actually practice. We're going to do that through two practices. They're kind of the same, but a little bit different. And those are the practices of petition and intercession. Petition means bringing our requests to God. It's very simple. Lord, give me this day my daily bread. Lord, give me what I need. Here's what I'm requesting. Here's what I'm asking for. We just learn to sit and in the vulnerable spot of trusting our heavenly father, we give him what we need and we trust him with his response. Secondarily to that, or in addition to that, there's also the practice of intercession. Intercession is instead of bringing our requests to God, we bring requests for others to God. We let this line stay plural right? Because Jesus doesn't say, give me this day my daily bread. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And that's the invitation of intercession, right? That we don't just look out and pray for what we need. We also walk in deep community with those around us such that we're praying for their needs as well. And so what I want to do is invite us into this space in a few ways. The first uh, is that I'm going to invite you to actually sit and be quiet before the Lord. And maybe what you need to do over the next few minutes is just petition him for things, right? To just go before him and plead with him on some things you have been refusing to ask him for. Or maybe you've been asking him for for months and you just need re-upped faith that you can ask him and continue to ask boldly. For those of us in the room, we need to go intercede on behalf of others. You have that thing deep down in the back of your mind that that person in your community group asked you to pray for like two weeks ago, and with good intentions in your heart, you said yes, and then you just forgot, because we're humans, right? And we live. We live life, and that's what happens. But maybe the Lord's bringing it back up to you now, stirring it a way of reminding, and so you just need to go over the next few minutes, and you're going to go, and you're going to pray for them. Hey, you told me this thing. I'll be honest. I forgot to pray, but I'm praying now. So is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. So some of us, we need to sit with the Lord and petition him for things we need. Others of us, we need to move around the room. We need to go intercede on behalf of others. There's a third category. For some of us, we need intercession from others. And so you need to go ask others to pray for what you need. Let me just invite you. This is something we have space for every single Sunday in our prayer team. Every single Sunday. The reason why the prayer team exists is to intercede on your behalf to Jesus, to God, right? That's the whole point. That's why they are there. And some of us don't understand how powerful of an invitation that is because there's not a line for our prayer team every Sunday. And if we understood prayer, I think there'd be a line for our prayer team every single Sunday, because here's a group of folks who say, hey, I want to pray for you. How many of us deep down in our soul just wishes there'd be more people that could pray for us? I do, right? Are you kidding me? I want people praying for me all the time. And that's the invitation of our prayer team. And for some some of us, we need to get over the hurdle of our fear, and we need to go to the prayer team and say, you know what? This is a new Sunday routine for me. Every Sunday after the sermon, I'm getting prayer from the prayer team. They're going to get annoyed with me because I got some requests. So that's the invitation. I'm going to pray and I'm going to give a space in just a second. But the three invitations, petition, go to God. You can stay in your seat. You can cry. You can close your eyes. You can walk around. I don't care. Pray for God for what you need. Step two, for some of us, we need to intercede for others. I actually gave my God, you know, I gave God my needs this morning. I'm going to go pray for somebody else. That's what I need to do. Third category, some of us need to get prayer. We need to get intercession on our behalf. Make sense? That's what we're doing. Let me pray for us. Prayer team, y'all can move. Um, Evan, you can come on up and we'll, uh, we'll get rolling. God, thank you. For who you are, Lord, thank you for your kindness to us. Lord, thank you that you tell us, give us this day our daily bread. That's the prayer. And so, Lord, I don't don't know if, if anything that I rambled about for the last 25 minutes made sense, but here's what I hope does make sense, Lord, that would you get this into our hearts? You tell us to bring our requests to you. So, Lord, we're gonna, in faith, believe you. We're going to push against our cynicism. We're going to push against our doubt. We're going to push against our weirdness. We're going to push against our anxiety. And we're just going to say, Lord, we're going to go to you. But so I pray over the next few minutes, God, you would give us bold, confident hearts to ask for daily bread and faith.
trusting you. We trust you. We trust you, but we trust you're going to answer how you see fit. Yeah, this is not meaningless. This is communion. So we're going to ask you for things. All right, I'm going to come back up in a minute to lead us into communion and worship. But you got space. If you need to pray for your own needs, if you need to get up, feel free to go pray for somebody else. Garrison and I are going to be down front if you want us to pray for you. As your pastors, we're more than happy to do that. Our prayer team's around the room. Get prayer, pray, do what you need to do. And I'll come back up in a minute.